Hello, this is Leadership Live. I'm David Rubenstein coming to you from my home in Bethesda, Maryland. I talk to many CEOs who are either working in their offices or working remotely uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. And today I'm very pleased that Ken Frazier, the CEO and chairman of Merck is my special guest. Ken, thank you very much for doing this. It's a pleasure, David. So Ken, you are surrounded with things behind you that look like uh, Merck products. Are you in your office now? I am indeed. I try to come here three days a week at a minimum. So do you normally work at home? Have you been working remotely uh, during this COVID crisis? I've been working a mixture of both. I like working at home because I'm around my family, or at least around my spouse. But coming in, we still have a lot of people who have to work here. We have 17,000 people who are either working in laboratories or in production facilities. And I think it makes sense to show up every once in a while. So if you're a pharmaceutical company, especially one working on uh, COVID-19 vaccines, do you get special permission to come to work or you don't need uh, special permission? I don't need special permission, although I had a permission slip in my car for the longest time, but no state troopers ever stopped me. Okay, let's talk about vaccines. Uh, Merck is one of the great vaccine manufacturers in the world and has been for some time. I think you are among the original people that did the measles vaccine, re most recently the Ebola vaccine. Correct. So. Um, but when the government of the United States announced they were going to give money to five companies to come up with vaccines, you were not one of them. Is there a reason you didn't want to be in that program? And what are you actually doing now to develop a vaccine? Well, we actually got a little bit of money through the program from Varda. We got about $38 million. But by and large, I think our approach to uh, coming up with vaccines is we try to make sure that we are focused only on the science. So funding considerations to us are secondary. And we're working on two different vaccines right now. Both of those vaccines have certain things in common. The first of which is that we believe they both can confer uh, protection with a single dose, which we think is extremely important. Uh, both of these vaccines give the promise of being able to be deployed broadly. And in the history of the world, there's never been one vaccine that had to be given to every person on the earth, all 7.5 billion. Uh, and then the last thing is that we wanted to use proven platforms. That is to say, uh, if you think about a vaccine, let's give a little bit of an analogy. Uh, the front end of the vaccine is the antigen or the protein that actually stimulates the immune system against a particular virus, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. That gets plugged into what we call a platform, which is sort of like the hardware. And the two platforms we have chosen are platforms that have already been approved by the FDA in, in different contexts. So one is the measles virus platform. You mentioned that before. Measles virus vaccine has been given to billions of people around the world safely. And then the second one is called a vesticular stomatitis virus platform, which we used in our Ebola vaccine, the most recent one that's been approved. So for us, it was really important to be able to work with proven platforms that we know are safe and effective and have been used in many, many people. So messenger RNA, which is being used by Moderna, are you comfortable that that can work or you're not as sure that that will be able to work? Well, that's not a technology that we're pursuing. I think one of the great things about this whole uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine situation is there are about 160 different vaccine programs that are pending with very different technologies. Messenger RNA, actually some people think that will offer the promise of speed, uh, but for us, again, we wanted to make sure that we have a proven platform and, and have confidence that a vaccine could be done with one dose. And so Merck has a lot of experience with a form of vaccine that's a weakened virus vaccine, an attenuated virus vaccine. That's what we've done before. That's what we know. And, and therefore, that's where we went. Okay, some of the companies have been given billions of dollars by uh, the federal government. Is that an unfair advantage to somebody like you that's gotten, relatively speaking, a modest amount? Is that something you're worried about or you don't care? Well, you know, I won't say I don't care. I have to manage a P&L, David. But at the same time, as I said at the outset, uh, we want to be able to pursue this in a scientifically rigorous, orderly way. And so for us, we think if we're able to come forward with a vaccine and we're confident that we will, we think the funding will eventually be there. So I don't think it's a disadvantage. OK, when you say you're confident you, they will come through, when is, I guess, the question you get asked all the time. When will there be a vaccine? The end of this year, early next year, middle of next year? Well, I won't speak to other people's vaccine programs, but what I would say is that we expect to go into human testing with our vaccines 
both of them by the end of the year. Uh, what I can tell you is that the fastest vaccine ever developed uh, was our mumps vaccine, and that took four years. So now we know that the urgency of the situation is going to cause us to try to move quickly, but never, ever at the expense of safety. So human trials, you mean phase one, phase two, phase three, what, what phase are you in now? Well, that's part of the way that I think people are thinking about uh, speeding up the whole vaccine development. So uh, for us, we are, we're thinking about going into human trials. Uh, often you can call those phase one slash phase two trials if they're designed in the right way. The FDA came out recently with some very thoughtful guidance. Uh, and what they've said, among other things, is that they wouldn't even approve a vaccine for emergency use unless there was six months of observation of data. So that gives you a sense that the fastest it could be is, let's say, a year from now. Well, some companies that are getting money from the federal government under the Operation Warp Speed program are actually manufacturing the vaccine already on the hope that they get approved. Are you manufacturing the vaccine that you're developing or you're not manufacturing it yet? No, we're scaling up to be able to make hundreds of millions of doses of both vaccines. So that's another example of what I mean about trying to compress the time period without sacrificing safety in any way. So we'll, we're gonna be prepared if the data bears out that one or both of these vaccines are useful from a safety efficacy, uh, from a risk benefit standpoint, we're gonna be ready to, to come forward with hundreds of millions of doses in, a, in fairly short order. Well, two questions that arise if there is a vaccine is, how do you get it? What's the distribution and how much does it cost? So how are you gonna decide who gets this vaccine first? And okay. what are you gonna charge for it? So I'm glad you raised the distribution issue because often people are talking about the scientific conundrum of coming forward with a, a vaccine that works. In some ways, maybe even a harder problem is what you just put your finger on, which is distribution. So again, I say again, uh, you know, this is a global pandemic. It's everywhere in the world. I, I often say that none of us are safe until all of us are safe. So it's gotta be given broadly to humanity. So we need a vaccine that we can make and distribute around the world. Now, one of the challenges on distribution, and I'll be blunt, is that we are seeing a lot of sort of nationalistic uh, a desire to make sure that one country gets it before the other. Uh, and the challenge for us is that we believe that the vaccine should go first to certain populations. So let's say frontline health workers should get it early. People who are particularly vulnerable because of their age or because of their comorbid conditions, their other sicknesses, ought to get it next. And so the challenge for us in the first instance is to make sure that we get it to the people who need it most, uh, but also beyond that, to make sure that we can get it to people in the US, uh, other countries in the Western world, but very importantly, it's also got to get to people in the developing countries where they don't have the ability to pay. And Merck has a long history, frankly, of working with governments and nonprofits to make sure that our vaccines are broadly, accessibly, uh, and affordably available. I know uh, Merck long, long ago worked with uh, former President Jimmy Carter, I think, uh, in helping to cure some diseases in Africa, in which you were um, very instrumental. Yes, river blindness, we've given billions of doses for free. And in many places in the world, we've eradicated that disease. We're very proud of that. You know, the Ebola vaccine is not something you do for profit either. Uh, we're very pleased that a couple of weeks ago, the WHO declared the latest outbreak in the Congo to have been put down, to have been stopped, to be. So those are the things that you do because, you know, it's one thing to, to invest, David, in the diseases that you can make money off, the diseases that affect the rich areas of the world. But there are a lot of great, unappreciated, neglected diseases that affect people in, in poor uh, areas of the world that also have to be dealt with. Well, some people say that vaccines aren't that profitable to begin with because if you just take it once a year, as opposed to once a month or once a week, you just don't make that much money. Is that a fair comment by some people? I don't think it's a fair comment at all. Uh, you know, if you go back to the 1980s, uh, there were a lot of vaccine companies in the United States. Uh, uh, Merck and Pfizer are the only two left. And Merck is the only, I think, one that really does a lot of research in this area as, long, as, as well as infection diseases. At that time, people said you should get out of the business because it wasn't a profitable business. Right. We find if you have something that makes a big difference, in our case, our leading vaccine is Gardasil for HPV. Uh, we've been able to make that vaccine a very successful vaccine from a commercial standpoint. And also from a public health standpoint, it's now being viewed as something that can help 
in, in that eliminate cervical cancer. Now, um, some people say that pharmaceutical companies make too much money. And as you know, there's no politician that doesn't like to run against a pharmaceutical company. The drug companies are always getting beat up. And I think there are very few people you can criticize anymore. But one of the people you can criticize is drug companies. So why is it that drug companies have an image that they're charging too much? Well, that's, that's a complicated question. Let me first start by acknowledging that there have been some bad actors. Generally speaking, those bad actors, however, are not in the part of the industry that we are in. I think the public thinks of it as one monolithic industry. Often, when you've seen these price gougers, they are people who have a single product, usually a generic, for which there's no other source, and they jack the price up. Uh, we are a research-based pharmaceutical company. Uh, we spend every year a significant amount of money. Last year, almost $10 billion on R&D. That's 21 cents on every dollar of revenue. And so when you look at our business, you have to think about, you know, what's the cost of capital for a business that puts that much money at risk uh, for that long a period of time, and it takes 12 to 15 years to develop a drug. And this is a business that's characterized by failure. What do I mean by that, David? For every 100 programs that we think are important enough to proceed with, we find out that more than 90% are not the right idea. So this is a business that's characterized by failure. And so what people tend to do is they look at the relatively few winners and they say, look how much money you're making on that drug, not recognizing that you have to pay for all the failures. So that's to me, I think that's the issue. In the business you're in, the pharmaceutical business, uh, you either develop uh, the drugs as you do, or you buy the drugs from somebody that might have developed at a smaller company. Uh, which do you tend to do at Merck? You develop them yourself or do you actually buy some other companies that already have developed something? Well, we do both, but we think of ourselves as a discovery house. Uh, we invest a lot of money in basic biology. We talked about COVID-19. Before we started working on a vaccine program or on our antiviral program, because we have a third program for a therapeutic, we spent a lot of time investigating the fundamental biology of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, as well as its impact on the immune system. So Merck has historically been a science-based company. At the same time, no company should be have the hubris to believe that it can internally develop enough uh, drugs to keep it growing, especially when you're a drug a company of our size with $46 billion worth of revenues. So about 50% of our drugs come from the outside, generally very early in development so that we can add value. And then the other half come from internally. Many CEOs with whom I've talked in this program say, well, there people are working remotely and eventually they'll come back, but they're not rushing to come back. And they don't actually say they're going to hire everybody back because maybe they've learned to be more efficient or not sure the business is going to be there. Are you sure that all your employees will want to come back to work on the, in the office? And are you sure you will need all those employees uh, over the next couple of years? I think the way in which people work in the office context is permanently changed. I think there will always be a reason for a workplace. Uh, people need to collaborate, they need to exchange ideas. But I think we've seen that for many office-based employees, they can be just as productive at home as they can be in the office many times. Now, obviously, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're manufacturing medicines and vaccines, you're doing discovery and laboratories, you know, that's all wet stuff. You can't do that from your home office. You've gotta be in the laboratory or in the manufacturing plant. Uh, but by and large, I'm confident that uh, this pandemic will not cause Merck to be in a position where it will have to furlough or lay off people. Uh, our people are doing a lot of hard work. Uh, we've been able to maintain the supply of drugs. We've been able to maintain our clinical trials uh, with our people scattered all around. They're very devoted and, and, and we're devoted to them. So when you do manufacturing of the drugs, you actually manufacture them, is, is that done by most pharmaceutical companies in the United States? Or is that like healthcare supplies? We've now learned a lot of it's made in China. Well, we do have global supply chains, not just in China, uh, but all over the world. Uh, we do a lot of manufacturing in Europe. We do a lot of manufacturing uh, in uh, the US, most of it in the US, but we do do a fair amount of it in places like China. And I think what people are referring to is that most of the fundamental pharmaceutical ingredients are manufactured in China. So we have these global supply chains. They were designed essentially for efficiency. And I think, again, going back to the concerns that have been raised, 
Now people are saying maybe those supply chains ought to be do, uh, completely within a country like the United States. I happen to disagree with that. I think these supply chains work well by and large. Uh, I think that if we were to try to do that, not only would it be ex hugely expensive to try to do that, but I don't think they would work as well as the global supply chains that we have now. Now, the governor of New Jersey, where Merck is based, um, asked you to co-chair a, a commission to uh, restart and recover the economy, I guess, in New Jersey. And you're chairing that, co-chairing it with Shirley Tillman, the former uh, president of Princeton. Um, so is it probable that you can reopen through a phase three in New Jersey, or has there been a concern that the virus is coming back a bit? I think there is a concern. Uh, recently, Governor Murphy, who was a fantastic governor, uh, has made the decision to pause uh, our phase two. Uh, and the reason for that is frankly, we looked at some of the experience in other places in the country. Uh, and we see that where people opened up restaurants for in indoor dining and bars, we saw a resurgence of the virus. And from the very beginning, Governor Murphy has made it extremely clear that this is gonna be data driven. We're gonna look at things like transmission rates. We're gonna look at things like hospitalization rates. We're gonna look at things like death rates. We're gonna make sure that we don't put New Jersey citizens in a position where they're gonna be at, you know, at risk or unnecessary risk. So I think we will reopen. We will reopen more slowly than we had hoped to reopen. And I think one, one data point I would share with you at one point, New Jersey was number two in the country in terms of new cases per 100,000 citizens. Right now, we're number 40. And so to go from the second most right. cases to number 40 really reflects, first of all, the great frontline healthcare workers we have in New Jersey, but also the leadership of Governor Murphy and his, and his cabinet. So if phase three is gonna be postponed a bit, maybe that's gonna happen in other states, and we now see in, in Florida and Texas and other places, there's a lot of the virus catching on. Are you worried that the U.S. economy will not come back anytime soon and we're going to be in this recession for quite some time? I am worried. Uh, you know, the vast majority of Americans, David, work for small businesses. They don't work for companies like Merck. And I worry a little bit about how resilient those small businesses can be, those restaurants, when they've now been told that they have to be closed for longer. Uh, so I am worried about the economy, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, with whether you're a small, medium or large business, uh, the best customers are the ones that are healthy. Uh, and if we don't have healthy customers, the economy can't come back anyway. So order, you know, job number one is to protect the American people and to keep the virus as low as it possibly can be so that it doesn't overwhelm our medical system and, and that really comes down to whether or not we as Americans are willing to take the advice we've been given about wearing masks, social distancing, uh, continuing to pay attention to our hygiene, et cetera. Now you and I are both trained as lawyers, but uh, I wasn't a good lawyer. You were actually a partner in a major firm and you were obviously a very good lawyer, um, but you got out of that business. And how does somebody who has a legal background, you're a graduate of Harvard Law School, how does somebody who has a legal background run a pharmaceutical company? How did it come about that you came to Merck and how did you become the CEO uh, of that company? Well, I, I, I've been extremely fortunate uh, at all stages of my career. When I was a, a practicing lawyer, I had great mentors in the private practice of law. Uh, but one of my clients was Merck and I did a lot of trial work for them around the country, actually vaccine trials in those days. And the CEO of Merck in the uh, early 1990s was a guy named Dr. Roy Vagelos. And uh, he was maybe two years from retirement and he called me and he asked me to come up and interview. Uh, he promised me that he was going to give me a job in the legal department if I would come. I came for one year, I was in the legal department and then he called me and he switched me out of the legal department. He put me in the business for my next six years, I was uh, in the business. And I think his willingness to take a chance on somebody who wasn't at the company somebody who was an outside lawyer and was able to say, I think you can do more than practice law, uh, gave me a great opportunity. And, and I think on my best day as CEO, having had access to him, as well as some the other two CEOs who were between him and me, Ray Martin and Dick Clark, uh, I think having access to them gave me the preparation to do the job that I'm doing now. So uh, did you come from a middle class or upper income family um, and that was no. the background you had or what was your background? 
So I was born and raised in the inner city of Philadelphia. I guess that's the new term. When I was raised in North Philadelphia, it was known as the ghetto. Uh, my father had a third grade education. Uh, he was a janitor. Uh, but he had very high standards. He and my mother had extremely high standards. And what changed my life, to be frank, is that uh, the social engineers in Philadelphia, who I didn't know, uh, decided to, uh, to indulge an experiment called school desegregation. And so I was put on a bus uh, in the birth order. My younger sister and I were coming along at a time when this experiment was being run. And we were sent to, frankly, good schools. Uh, rigorous schools, and we we're given a better education uh, than the people in my neighborhood. Uh, my neighborhood high school, Thomas Edison, I'll just say, uh, parenthetically, is, is famous for one thing. It sent more boys to their death in Vietnam than any high school in the country. So you go from those kinds of schools to rigorous schools, and that closed what I call the opportunity gap that many African American people in this country still face every day. Now, did your parents live to see your success? My mother died when I was very young. I was around 13 years old, but my father lived to see uh, me become a lawyer and a partner and a senior executive at Merck. So in the Fortune 500, there are four CEOs who are African-American. You're one of four. Um, are you surprised that in this day and age, there's so few? And why do you think there are so few who are becoming CEOs or are CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies? I would say that if you had gone back 25 years, the most pessimistic observer would have thought we would have had more than four out of 500. So I can't say that that's uh, something that doesn't surprise me on one level. On the other level, I think we have to be honest in this country. I think we have to recognize that there's subtleties to our history around race, uh, that people who are African-American, for the most part, find themselves in a situation where they have to overcome uh, some customs, some beliefs, uh, and it's much harder for many African-Americans uh, to find their way to these positions. I just mentioned that Dr. Vagelos brought me out of a law firm and put me here. I think one of his reasons, uh, frankly, because he said this publicly and in a book, is he wanted to have a diverse management team. And so I was brought in in part for that reason, but I was also given opportunities, stretch assignments. And so I don't think my experience is typical for African-Americans in corporate America. What, what have you done to increase or make certain that you have minority employees at Merck since you've been the CEO? Well, one of the things that we try to do is to make sure that at the senior level, uh, at our board level and at our senior uh, management level, we are a diverse group. And I think if you look at our senior management team, it's probably, if not the most diverse uh, team in, in large companies, uh, it's, it's close to that. On the other hand, I think you've got to look at all levels of the company. And what we're trying to do inside Merck is to ensure that we create an environment where all employees, uh, irrespective of gender, uh, race, sexual orientation, uh, can reach their full potential. We haven't gotten to where we need to get, I would say particularly with respect to African-Americans at lower levels below the senior management levels, uh, we have a challenge. And I think we're gonna have to step up to that challenge. And the way that you do that is frankly, uh, you begin to establish targets and you, manage to those targets in the best way you can, consistent with how you have to run your company. Now, uh, your company not only has an African-American CEO, but an African-American lead outside director, Les Brun, maybe the only mm -hmm. com company in the country with those kind of uh, an African-American in both those positions, but the, your board uh, recently allowed you to stay be beyond the normal retirement age of 65. So they obviously want you to stay, uh, but how long are you planning to stay? And I, are you asked to go into, public office, a cabinet, or, or run for a president, run for Senate, run for governor? Are you asked that all the time? And what is your response? Well, I'm going to stay as long as the board wants me to stay. I serve at their pleasure, obviously. I will say that there are great internal candidates for my job. We have a very strong management bench here at Merck. Uh, and so the board will make a decision as to when they think it's the right time for that transition. As it relates to you know, politics outside of Merck, uh, sometimes people mention that to me, but I have a hard time taking them seriously. Well, okay, but that means maybe, but you, you'll see down the road. Uh, I would say that it's highly unlikely because you know I'm not very good at politics with a big capital P or a small P. <laughs> so well, let's suppose you didn't go into politics and let's suppose at some point you leave uh, before you're 80, uh, what would you wanna do next? 
You know, David, one of the things that I care about very much is dealing with this issue of, of societal inequality, uh, income inequality, and another important area is access to justice. And so I think there are lots of opportunities for somebody who cares about those kinds of issues to get involved in, in, in causes that actually help people. You know, I, I mentioned before, I was born in a fairly uh, humble situation and, and I feel like I've been extremely blessed to be where I am now. And so I think uh, to the extent that I've been able to be successful, uh, I have to think about using my resources as a tool to help other people. Now, you and I have worked together on access to justice issues. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with that, what is the basic problem with access to justice? Doesn't everybody get the right to have a lawyer in this country if they need one? No, they, they don't have that right. So let's start with the civil side of the equation. You know, for many people, they face existential almost crises all the time uh, with respect to housing, with respect to, let's say, domestic abuse, with respect to parental rights, with respect to getting government benefits to which they're entitled. And, you know, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In some ways, for many people in this country, you can't have life, liberty, or pursue happiness if you don't have a lawyer, uh, because so much depends on how the legal system works. And we believe in this concept of equal justice under law, but you can't have that equal justice under law if many, many poor people, disadvantaged people, could never even dream of having a lawyer. And I think some of the greatest heroes in our society are legal aid lawyers, legal services lawyers, public defenders, who have this huge amount of caseload, but can't even begin to make a dent. And as Americans, whether we're corporate America, whether we're government, whether we're civil society, we have to recognize that we claim to believe in this creed, equal justice under the law, but it's not uh, a reality. So when you talk to other CEOs about this issue, do you get kind of glazed eyes and they say, why are you talking about this? Go, why don't you run your company? Well, there's some who care about it, um, but for the most part, it is not a, a major issue for most people. I do think in the last few weeks with the whole George Floyd situation, we've now got an opportunity as a nation to look at the discrepancies between, again, the stated creeds of this country and the realities of this country, and to ask ourselves whether or not we want to close those gaps or whether we want to, in essence, kick the can down the road to future generations. So given your position and your background, do you consider yourself a role model for other African-Americans and other CEOs? And do you want to be a role model or you don't want to really be a role model? I don't think I have a choice because of the scarcity. There's only four African-Americans in the, in the Fortune 500. When I was coming up, I obviously looked at lawyers who are African-Americans like Thurgood Marshall and Bill Coleman and others. Uh, and I, you know, I hope that I serve that role uh, for people. I try uh, every day to uh, perform in such a way as to give people confidence that they can do what I can do. Because I will say, I do feel a little bit like an imposter in the sense that by fortune, I happen to be put on that bus as opposed to kids that grew up around me. And I know that changed the trajectory of my life. So uh, today, as you look back on your life, what are you most proud of having accomplished so far? Well, besides my family, I have to say the single biggest accomplishment I've ever had was uh, I, I took a client's case who was not very far away from his execution date in Alabama, and eventually he became a free man. I know as a CEO, you wouldn't expect me to say that, uh, but representing Bo Cochran and getting him off death row after 19 years for a crime he didn't commit was probably the thing that uh, to me is the most important thing I've ever done. So um, when I listen to you, I feel relatively inadequate because of all the things you've done. So can you make me feel better by saying you're not good at something? You know, you failed at something so that others who are watching as well can say he's not perfect. Uh, do, you, do you have any flaws that you could mention that, you know, people could say, well, he's not perfect? Well, let's, let's be clear. My, if my wife were here, she would give you a long list. Uh, and I have so many flaws. Uh, but the most important one is I think, you know, I struggle every day uh, to, uh, to listen to more people, to be more empathetic, uh, and to ensure that, that I'm actually helping people to achieve their best selves. Ken, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. I hope the vaccine comes as quickly as possible. 
and good luck to you. And I look forward to working with you in the future on access to justice matters. Thank you, David. And I'm optimistic that one of these companies will come up with a vaccine that will help the American people and people around the world. Thank you. Thank you.